Hey, greetings, everyone. Gleekon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. So, in our last episode, we uh, began the novel, The Day of the Dragon, and Ronan was selected by the Council of Archmages at Dalaran to, to go on a mission to watch, ostensibly, the, uh, what's it called, um, the place of the Twilight Hinterlands, the dungeon. Um, and not Cosmodon, but uh, dang it, in Cosmodon, Tolbrad. Um, and really, though, the point, and this is kind of what Krasis was hinting at, is that really we want to set in motion events that will lead to Alex Strasser getting set free. So stay a while and listen to this one. We're going to start Chapter 2 of The Day of the Dragon. Verisa did not like waiting. Most people thought that elves had the patience of glaciers, but younger ones such as herself, just a year out of her apprenticeship at the rangers, were very much like humans in that one regard. She had been waiting three days for this wizard she was supposed to escort to one of the eastern ports serving the Great Sea. For the most part, she respected wizards as much as any elf respected a human, but this one had earned nothing but her ire. Verisa wanted to join her sisters and brothers, help hunt down each and every remaining orc still fighting, and send the murderous beasts to their well-deserved deaths. The ranger had not expected her first major assignment to be playing nursemaid to some doddering and clearly forgetful old mage. One more hour, she muttered. One more hour, and then I leave. Her sleek chestnut-brown elven mare snorted ever so slightly. Generations of breeding had created an animal far superior to its mundane cousins, or so Verisa's people believed. The mare was in tune with her rider, and what would have seemed to most nothing more than a simple grunt from the horse immediately sent the ranger to her feet, a long shaft already notched in her bow. Yet the woods around her spoke only of quiet, not treachery. And this deep within the Lord Orana Lion, she could hardly expect an attack by either orcs or trolls. She glanced in the direction of the small inn that had been designated the meeting place, but other than a stable boy carrying hay, Verisa saw no one. Still, the elf did not lower her bow. Her mount rarely made a sound unless some trouble lurked nearby. Bandits, perhaps? Slowly, the ranger turned in a circle. The wind whipped some of the long, silver-white hair across her face, but not enough to obscure her sharp sight. Almond-shaped eyes, the color of purest sky blue, drank in even the most minute shift of foliage, and the lengthy pointed ears that rose from her thick hair could pick up even the sound of a butterfly landing on a nearby flower. And still, she could find no reason for the mayor's warning. Perhaps she had frightened away whatever supposed menace had been nearby. Like all elves, Verisa knew she made an impressive appearance. Taller than most humans, the ranger stood clad in knee-high leather boots, forest green pants and blouse, and an oak-brown travel cloak. Gloves that stretched nearly to her elbows protected her hands while yet enabling her to use her bow or the sword hanging at her side with ease. Over her blouse, she wore a sturdy breastplate fashioned to her slim but still curved form. One of the locals in the inn had made the mistake of admiring the feminine aspects of her appearance while entirely ignoring the military ones. Because he had been drunk and possibly would have held back his rude suggestions otherwise, Verisa had only left him with a few broken fingers. The mare snorted again. The ranger glared at her mount, words of reprimand forming on her lips. You would be Verisa Windrunner, I presume. A low, arresting voice on her blind side suddenly commented. She had the tip of the shaft directly at his throat before he could say more. Had Verisa let the arrow loose, it would have shot completely through the newcomer's neck, exiting through the other side. Curiously, he seemed unimpressed by this deadly fact. The elf stared him up and down, not an entirely unpleasant task, she had to admit, and realized that her sudden intruder could only be the wizard for whom she had been waiting. Certainly that would explain her mount's peculiar actions and her own inability to sense his presence before this. You are Ronin? the ranger finally asked. Not what you're expecting, he returned with just the hint of a sardonic smile. She lowered the bow, relaxing slightly. They said a wizard. That was all human. And they told me an elven ranger, nothing more. 
He gave her a glance that almost made Verisa raise the bow again. So we find ourselves even in this matter. Not quite. I have waited here for three days. Three valuable days wasted. Couldn't be helped. Preparations needed to be made. The wizard said nothing more. Verisa gave up. Like most humans, this one cared nothing for anyone but himself. She considered herself fortunate that she had not had to wait longer. It amazed her that the Alliance could have ever triumphed against the Horde with so many like this Ronin in their ranks. Well, if you wish to make your passage to Cosmo Don, then it would be best if we left immediately. The elf peered behind him. Where is your mount? She half expected him to tell him that he had none, that he had used his formidable powers to transport himself all the way here, but if that had been the case, Ronan would not have needed her to guide him to the ship. As a wizard, he no doubt had impressive abilities, but he also had his limits. Besides, from what little she knew of his mission, she suspected that Ronan would need everything he had just to survive. Cosmo Don was not a land welcoming to outsiders. The skulls of many brave warriors decorated the orc tents there, so she had heard, and dragons constantly patrolled the skies. No, not a place even Verisa would have gone without an army at her side. She was no coward, but she was also no fool. Tied near a trough by the inn so that he can get some water. I've all ridden, ridden long today, milady. His use of the title for her might have flattered Verisa, if not for the slight touch of sarcasm she thought she noted in his tone. Fighting down her irritation with the human, she turned to her own horse, replaced the bow and shaft, then proceeded to ready her animal for the ride. My horse could do with a few more minutes rest, the wizard suggested, and so could I. You will learn to sleep in the saddle quickly enough, and the pace I set at first will enable your steed to recoup. We have waited far too long. Few ships, even those of Kul Taras, are endeared to the thought of sailing to Cosmo Don simply for a wizard on observation duty. If you do not reach port soon, they may decide that they have more worthy and less suicidal matters with which to deal. To her relief, Ronan did not argue. Instead, with a frown, he turned and headed back toward the inn. Verisa watched him depart, hoping that she would not find herself tempted to run him through before they managed to part company. She wondered about his mission. True, Cosmo Don remained a threat because of the dragons and their orc masters there, but the Alliance already had other more well-trained observers in and around the land. Verisa suspected that Ronan's mission concerned a very serious matter, or else the Kirin Tor would have never risked so much for this arrogant mage. Still, had they considered the matter well enough when they had chosen him? Surely there had to have been someone more able and trustworthy. This wizard had a look to him, one that spoke of a streak of unpredictability that might lead to disaster. The elf tried to shrug off her doubts. The Kirin Tor had made up their minds in this matter, and Alliance Command had clearly agreed with them, or else she would not have been sent along to guide him. But she put aside any concerns. All she had to do was deliver her charge to his vessel, and then Verisa could be on her way. What Ronan might or might not do after their separation did not concern her in the least. For four days they journeyed, never once threatened by anything more dangerous than a few annoying insects. Had circumstances been different, the trek might have seemed almost idyllic, if not for the fact that Ronan and his guide had barely spoken with one another all that time. For the most part, the wizard had not been bothered much by that fact, his thoughts focused on the dangerous task ahead. Once the Alliance ship brought him to the shores of Cosmo Don, he would be on his own in a realm still overrun not only with orcs but patrolled from the sky by their captive dragons. While no coward, Ronin had little desire to face torture and slow agonizing death. For that alone, his benefactor and the Council had provided him with the latest known movements of the Dragon Maw clan. Dragon Maul would be most on the watch now, especially if, as Ronin had been told, the Black Leviathan Deathwing did indeed live. Yet as dangerous as the mage's quest appeared, Ronin would not have turned back. He had been given an opportunity to not only redeem himself, but to advance among the Kirin Tor, for that he would forever be most grateful to his patron, whom he only knew by the name Krasis. The title was surely a false one, not an uncommon practice among those in the ruling council, the masters of Dalaran were chosen in secret, their ascension known only to their fellows, not even their loved ones. The voice of Ronan's benefactor could be nothing like his true voice, if male was even the correct gender. It was possible to guess the identities of some of the inner circle, but Krasis remained an enigma even to his clever agent. In truth, though, Ronan barely even cared about Krasis' identity anymore, <clears throat> only that through him the younger wizard could achieve his own dreams. 
but those dreams would remain distant ones if he never made his ship. Leaning forward in the saddle, he asked how much farther to Hasek. Without turning, Verisa blandly replied, Three more days at least. Do not worry, our pace will now get us to the port on time. Ronan leaned back again. So much for their latest conversation, only the second of today. The only thing possibly worse than riding with an elf would have been traveling with one of the dour knights of the Silver Hand. Despite their ever-present courtesy, the paladins generally made it clear that they considered magic an occasional necessary evil, one with which they would do without at all other times. The last one that Ronin had encountered had quite clearly indicated that he believed that after death, the mage's soul would be condemned to the same pit of darkness shared by the mythical demons of old. This no matter how pure Ronin's soul might have been otherwise. The late afternoon sun began to sink among the treetops, creating contrasting areas of brightness and dark shadow among the trees. <clears throat> Ronin had hoped to reach the edge of the woods before dark, but clearly they would not do so. Not for the first time, he ran through his mental maps, trying not only to place their present location, but verify what his companion had said about still making the ship. His delay in meeting with Verisa had been unavoidable, the product of trying to find necessary supplies and components. He only hoped it would still not prove to jeopardize his entire mission to free the Dragon Queen. An impossible, improbable quest to some, certain death to most. Yet even during the war, Ronin had, approached, had proposed such. Clearly, if the Dragon Queen were freed, it would, at the very least, strip the remaining orcs one of one of their greatest weapons. However, circumstance had never enabled such a monumental quest to come to fruition. Ronan knew most of the council hoped he would fail. To be rid of him would be to erase what they considered a black mark from the history of their order. This mission had a double edge to it. They would be astounded if he succeeded, but relieved if he failed. At least he could trust in Krasis. The wizard had first come to him, asking if his younger counterpart still believed he could do the impossible. Dragon Maul Clan would forever retain its hold on Cosmo Dawn unless Alex Straza was freed, and so long as the orcs there continued the work of the Horde, they remained a possible rallying point for those in the Garden Enclaves. No one wanted the war renewed. The Alliance had enough strife within its own ranks to keep it busy. A brief rumble of thunder, thunder disturbed Ronan's contemplations. He looked up but saw only a few cottony clouds. Frowning, the fiery-haired spellcaster turned his gaze toward, gaze toward the elf, intending to ask her if she too had heard the thunder. A second, more menacing rumble set every muscle taut. At the same time, Verisa leapt at him. The ranger somehow having managed to turn in the saddle and push herself in his direction. A massive shadow covered their surroundings. The ranger and the wizard collided, the elf's armored weight shoving both off the back of Ronan's own mount. An ear-shadowing roar shook the vicinity and a force akin to a tornado ripped at the landscape. As the wizard struck the hard ground, through the shock of pain he heard the brief whinny of his mount, a sound cut off the next moment. Keep down, Verisa called above the wind and roaring. Keep down! Ronan, though, twisted around as to, so, to see the heavens, and saw instead a hellish sight. A dragon the color of raging fire filled the sky above. In its forepaws it held what remained of his horse and his costly and carefully chosen supplies. The crimson leviathan consumed in one gulp the rest of the carcass, eyes already fixed on the tiny pathetic figures below. And seated atop the shoulders of the beast, a grotesque greenish figure, with tusks and a battle axe that looked nearly as large as the mage, barked orders in some harsh tongue and pointed directly at Ronan. Maw gaping and talons bared, the dragon dove toward him. I thank you again for your time, your majesty, the tall black-haired noble said in a voice full of strength and understanding. Perhaps we can yet keep this crisis from tearing your good work asunder. If so, returned the older bearded figure clad in the elegant white and gold robes of state, Lord Ron and the Alliance will have much to thank you for, Lord Prester. It's only because of your work that I feel Gilnius and Stromgod might yet see reason. Although no slight man himself, King Terranus felt a little overwhelmed by his larger companion. The younger man smiled, revealing perfect teeth. If Terranus could have found a more regal-looking man than Lord Prester, he would have been surprised. With his short, well-groomed black hair, clean-shaven, hawk-like features that had set many of the women of the court a twitter, 
quick-minded, and bearing more princely than any prince in the alliance, it was not at all surprising that everyone involved in the Alterac situation had taken to him, Gen Greymane included. Prester had an engaging manner that had actually made the ruler of Gilnia smile on a rare occasion, so Terranus's marveling diplomats had informed him. For a young noble whom no one had even heard of prior to five years before, the king's guest had made quite a reputation for himself. Prester came from the most mountainous, most obscure region of Lordaeron, but could claim bloodlines in the royal house of Alterac as well. His tiny domain had been destroyed during the war by a dragon attack, and he had come to the capital on foot without even one servant to dress him. His plight and what he had made of himself since his arrival had become the thing of storybook tales. More important, his advice had aided the king many times, including during the dark days when the Grang monarch had debated on what to do about Lord Perinold. Prester had, in fact, been the swaying factor. He had given Terranus the encouragement needed to seize power in Alterac, then solidify martial law there. Stromgard and the other kingdoms had understood the need for action against the traitorous Perinold, but not Lordaeron's continued holding of that kingdom for its own purposes after the war had ended. Now at last, Prester appeared to be the one who could explain it all to them and make them accept any final decision. Which had of late made the aging, broad-featured monarch mull over a possible solution that would stun even the clever man before him. Terranus refused to turn over Alterac to Perinold's nephew, whom Gilnius had tried to support. Nor did he think it wise to divide the kingdom in question between Lordaeron and Stromgard. That would surely earn the wrath of not only Gilnius, but Kul Taras even. Annexing Alterac completely was also out of the question. What if, though, he placed the region in the capable hands of one admired by all? One who had shown he wanted nothing but peace and unity. An able administrator, too, if King Terranus were any judge, not to mention someone certain to remain a true ally and friend to Lordaeron. No, indeed, Presta. The king reached up to pat the much taller lord on the shoulder. Prester had to be nearly seven feet in height, but while slim he could hardly be called lanky. Prester well fit his blue and black dress uniform, looking every inch the martial hero. You've much to be proud about, and much to be rewarded for. I'll not soon forget your part in this, believe me. Prester fairly beamed, likely believing he would soon have his tiny realm restored to him. Terranus decided to let the boy keep that little dream. When the ruler of Lordaeron proposed him as new monarch of Alterac, the expression on Prester's face would be that much more entertaining. It was not every day that someone became king, unless they inherited the position, of course. Terranus's honored guests saluted him then, bowing gracefully, retreated from the imperial chamber. The elder man frowned after Prester left, thinking that the silken curtains, the golden chandeliers, and even the pure white marble floor could not brighten the room enough now that the young noble had departed. Truly Lord Prester stood out among the many odious courtiers flocking to the palace. Here was a man anyone could believe in, a man worthy of trust and respect in all matters. Terranus wished his own son could have been more like Prester. The king rubbed his bearded chin. Yes, the perfect man to rebuild the honor of a land and at the same time restore harmony between the members of the alliance. New and strong blood. Considering the matter further, Terranus thought of his daughter Calia. Still a child, but certainly soon to be a beauty. Perhaps one day, if matters went well, he and Prester could strengthen their friendship and alliance with a royal marriage, too. Yes, he would go talk to his advisors now, relate to them his royal opinion. Ternus felt certain that they would agree with him on this decision. He had met no one yet who disliked the young noble, King Prester of Alterac. Ternus could just imagine the look on his friend's face when he learned the extent of his reward. <clears throat> You've, a sm you've the shadow of a smile on your face. Did someone die a horrible, grisly, bloody death, O oh venomous one? Spare me your witticisms, Krill, Lord Prester replied as he shut the great iron door behind him. Above in the old chalet given over to him by his host, King Terranus, servants specifically chosen by Prester stood guard to see no un that no unwarranted visitors dropped in. Their master had work to do, and even if none of the servants truly knew what went on in the chambers below ground, they had been made to know that it would be their lives if he was disturbed. Prester expected no interruptions and trusted that those lackeys would obey to the death. The spell upon them, a variation of the one that caused the king and his court to so admire the dashing refugee, allowed no room for second thoughts. He had honed its effectiveness quite well over time. Most humble apologies, O oh prince of duplicity, rasped the smaller, wiry figure before him. 
The tone in the other's voice held hints of mischief and madness and an inhuman quality. Not surprising, as Prester's companion was a goblin. Whoops, I gotta change the voice. His head barely reaching above the noble's belt buckle, some might have taken the slight emerald green creature for weak and simple. The madcap grin, however, revealed long teeth so very sharp and a tongue blood-red and almost forked. Narrow yellow eyes with no visible pupils sparkled with merriment, but the sort of merriment that came from pulling the wings off flies or the arms off experimental subjects. A ridge of dull brown fur rose up from behind the goblin's neck, finishing as a wild crest above the hideous creature's squat forehead. Still, there is reason to celebrate. The lower chamber had once been used to house supplies. In those days, the coolness of the earth had kept wine rack after wine rack at just the right temperature. Now, however, thanks to a little engineering on the part of Krill, the vast room felt as if it sat in the middle of a raging volcano. For Lord Prester, it felt just like home. Celebrate, our master of deceit, Krill giggled. Krill giggled a lot, especially when foul work was afoot. The emerald creature's two chief passions were experimentation and mayhem, and whenever possible he combined the two. The back half of the chamber was in fact filled with benches, flasks, powders, curious mechanisms, and macabre collections all gathered by the goblin. Yes, yeah, celebrate, Krill. Prester's penetrating ebony eyes fixed unblinkingly on the goblin, who suddenly lost his smile and all semblance of mockery. You would like to be around to join that celebration, wouldn't you? Yes, master. The uniformed noble took a moment to breathe in the stifling air. An expression of relief crossed his angular features. Ah, oh, how I miss it, his face hardened. But I must wait. Go only when necessary, eh, Krill? As you say, master. The smile, now so very sinister, returned to Prester's expression. You are likely looking the next king of Alterac, you know. The goblin bent his narrow, muscular body nearly to the ground. Oh, hail his royal majesty, King De A clatter made both glance to the right. From a mental grate leading to an old ventilation shaft emerged a smaller goblin. Nimbly, the tiny figure pulled itself from the opening and rushed over to Krill. The newcomer wore a fiendishly amused look on his ugly face, a look that quickly faded under Prester's intense gaze. The second goblin whispered something into Krill's large, pointed ear. Krill hissed, then dismissed the other creature with a negligent wave of the hand. The newcomer vanished back through the open grate. What is it? Although the words came calmly and smoothly from the lips of the aristocrat, they also clearly demanded no hesitation on the part of the goblin to answer. Ah, gracious one, Krill began, the madcap smile once more upon his bestial face. Luck is with you this day, it seems. Perhaps you should consider making a wager somewhere. The stars must truly favor. What is it? Someone, someone is attempting to free Alexstrasza. Prester stared. He stared so long and with such intensity that Krill fairly shriveled up before him. Surely, now the goblin imagined, surely, now death would come. A pity that. There had been so many more experiments he had wanted to try. So many more explosives to test. At that moment, the tall black figure before him broke out laughing. A laugh deep, dark, and not entirely natural. Perfect, Lord Prester managed to utter between bouts of mirth. He stretched his arms out as if seeking to capture the very air. His fingers seemed impossibly long and almost clawed. So perfect! He continued to laugh, and as he did, the goblin krill settled back, marveling at the odd sight and shaking his head ever so slightly. And they call me man, he muttered under his breath. All right, cool. So we've been introduced to Deathwing's character, his goblin minions. Uh, we've seen a dragon flying around, and we have a small bump in the road for the mission that now Ronan with Verisa have teamed up. All right, we've got another episode of the Pipe 5x5. Five five. I thank everybody so much for listening. I look forward to seeing you next time on Lore of Warcraft.